Hello and welcome back. This is the last of our six videos about section 4.1. And in this video, we will discuss yet another variant of the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. This variant is called the independent sampler. And that is the special case where the proposals do not depend on the previous state. So in general, we have yj is sampled from some transition density, which looks at the previous state. And then as function of this state is the density and we sample y from this density. Or alternatively, in the discrete case, yj will be sampled from the probability weights where we again use the previous state and then take the row of the matrix as a probability vector. By this dot, I mean, leave the column index open so that we have the whole row. And that's a probability vector. And again, we sample y from that probability vector. And in the case of the independent sampler, we don't make use of the right to adjust the proposals depending on xj minus one. So instead, here we have yj sampled just from a density which only depends on y, but is independent of the previous state. The reason that this is sometimes useful is that if we just assume, for an example, that the target density somehow has some gaps in it, so there is here in my example, a region where the target density equals zero. There are no samples expected here. And then we know every time a proposal falls into this range, then it's rejected. And if we just think of the previous video, if we think what would the random walk metropolis sampler do, there always when we are in a state xj minus one, we would generate a proposal kind of nearby. So we would say, that's xj minus one. And then what we do is we add epsilon j to get xj is xj minus one plus epsilon j. So in a sense, for the random walk metropolis sampler, the proposals are close to the previous state. And we know if we hit the gap, we get the proposal rejected. That was here. If pi of y equals zero, pi of the proposal, then the acceptance probability is zero. So the algorithm may have trouble to cross this gap. So if proposals falling in the gap are rejected, and if we progress in jumps, we need a really long jump to get over here. And sometimes this affects how the algorithm works, and it can take a really long time to discover the second bulge here, and samples first will stay here for a long time, and then once it makes it over, samples will stay here for a long time, and that will make for a poor Monte Carlo estimate. So let's put that away. The independent sampler tries to solve this problem. If we know where the target density pi is constrained, we could generate samples, let's just assume a uniform distribution or so, anywhere in this range. And then we have no problem of reaching the individual regions where pi is concentrated. And we have no problems crossing gaps because the new values, new proposals are independent of the previous value. And if you look at this, that makes the method similar in character to rejection sampling. We could also sample from pi using rejection sampling. And there's still a difference, but it is similar in spirit. So let us see what happens in this case. So if pi xy is just pi of y, doesn't depend on x, then alpha xy, which in general is pi of y pyx divided by pi of x pxy and one. And then what we get is just minimum of pi of y px, pi of x py, and one. So the x and y are crossed over, pi of y is on top, p of y is at the bottom, and other way around for x. And that is really the only simplification which happens. So the algorithm then takes the following form. So I just wrote alpha, let's just change this here. We have minimum pi y p of x divided by pi of x py and one. Up here, instead of p being a transition density, I have p of y is just an ordinary probability density, which means integral p of y dy equals one. And down here where we generate the samples, we no longer have a dependence on x, so we just sample yj from the density p. So that's the algorithm. There are very few changes, but 
as I said, in situations like this, that it can sometimes be useful. In that set, it's similar to rejection sampling, but you see, even if y does not depend on the previous stage, x still does depend on the previous stage. First, directly, sometimes the new state equals the previous state if we reject, so there is a direct dependency, but also in here is the previous state, so even the acceptance probability still depends on the previous state. So that is somewhere between general Metropolis Hastings, where even the proposal is allowed to depend on the previous state, and rejection sampling, where we look at each sample individually. And this method is what is called independent sampling. So finally, I want to just make a general remark about all variants of the Metropolis Hastings algorithm, namely the General alpha was alpha xy equals minimum pi of y p y x divided by pi of x p x y and 1. And what I just want to point out here is something which is obvious once you think about it, namely these pi's, they are divided by each other, and that is the only point in the algorithm where pi comes in, so it's only used in the acceptance probability. And the consequence is that if we know pi only about a multiplicative constant, so if, for example, we have pi of x is 1 over z f of x, and we don't know the normalizing constant z, then that is no problem, because alpha is minimum 1 over z f of y p y x and 1 over z f of x p x y minimum is 1. And you see here, whatever the normalizing constant is, we don't need to bother with it because it cancels. So similar to rejection sampling we discussed earlier, the Metropolis Hastings method in all variants can be used if we don't know the normalizing constant. So instead of pi, we can just use the unnormalized density, the thing I call f here, and the method will still work because in this fraction, the constants cancel out. That applies to all variants. For example, here, pi's have cancelling constants. And similarly, for random walk metropolis, again, the pi's are divided by each other. So that concludes our discussion of variants of the Metropolis Hastings algorithm. In the book, there's an additional subsection 4.1.5, which discusses what I call Metropolis Hastings with different move types. That is also useful, but I'm not going to cover this in these videos. So we have reached the end of our discussion of section 4.1. So this was quite a long section, as you saw from the fact there were six videos about this section. And it is also quite an important section. So what you should do really is to go back and reread the whole section now and think about a bit what we did there. So we had this a bit funny way of generating random samples, which is done by generating a Markov chain. And we have an algorithm for constructing these Markov chains. And I have hinted at the relation between stationary distributions and the Markov chain actually converging to this distribution. And that will also be the topic of the next video. So in the upcoming videos about section 4.2, we'll learn how to use these methods as part of Monte Carlo estimates. And this will then be what is called Markov chain Monte Carlo estimates. So we have the main ingredient, but we still need to see how can we actually turn that into an estimate. So see you in the next videos and don't forget to reread section 4.1. Goodbye, everybody.